Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning in verse 1. We're just going to read verse 1 for now, but you want to hold your spot there because we're going to talk about this chapter tonight. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1, from the New King James Version. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of owns. And one other scripture before I had let you be seated, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. So he answered and he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Father, bless your word tonight. Help me to do my job. Holy Spirit, I give you freedom to do yours in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, welcome to Holy Ghost Night at King's Chapel. As I was praying in the midst of a very busy schedule that I'm currently operating in, I, I heard the Holy Spirit say this to me. If this is Holy Ghost Night, and that's what we call it around here on Wednesdays, then here is a word from me, the Holy Spirit said, to give to the people about me. Kind of stands to reason that on Holy Ghost Night, we would preach about him. Somebody should talk about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost on Holy Ghost Night. So let me set a few things straight about the Holy Spirit real quick uh, before I give you the full double barrel of what the Holy Spirit wants you to hear tonight. Who is the Holy Spirit? Now notice I didn't say what is the Holy Spirit, but rather who is the Holy Spirit? Because he, the Holy Spirit, isn't an object. He isn't an it. He is the third person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He isn't the force. You won't hear him say, use the force, Luke. He isn't the force. He isn't an object. He's God. Church, he was there at the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, Genesis tells us. And it says the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. So the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, was there at the very beginning. He was there when Jesus was promised to be the Messiah birthed through a virgin because it says in Matthew chapter 1, the angel telling Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary to be your wife because that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Spirit. He was there at the baptism of Jesus. The Spirit, it says, like a dove in the form of a dove, descending upon Jesus as he came up out of the water with his father saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He is very real, church. He isn't just some supernatural power that a select few get to have or to hold on to. He is God dwelling in us with the potential to overflow out of us if we will let him. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Amen. I think y'all are with me tonight. He is a person. He can be lied to. In the book of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit. Peter said, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? And of course, you know, if we had things happen in the modern day church today like they did in the book of Acts, not only would we see a lot of miracles and signs and wonders and a lot of things happening, but we'd have a whole lot more people walking in holiness because we know what happened to Ananias and Sapphira when they lied to the Holy Spirit. They got struck dead and drug out by, carried out by, by young men from the church. He can be grieved. Paul says and tells us in Ephesians as he wrote to the church at Ephesus, do not grieve, which means wound or insult the Holy Spirit. Oh, I could go on tonight, church. He is worthy of our worship because he is God. He is vital to our worship because Jesus said, true worshipers will worship me in spirit and in truth. He's God, church. He's called the spirit of truth. He's called the spirit of life. He has several jobs recorded in scripture. He's the convictor of of sins. The Bible says that's the job of the Holy Spirit, that he comes and convicts the world of their sin. And he convicts you and I when we start to stray. He lovingly calls us back. He's the one that holds up the red flag and says, whoa, don't do that. Don't go there. Don't walk that way. Because if you do, it won't end well. Now, how do you know if it's conviction as opposed to condemnation? Well, the book of Romans tells us there is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. So if a voice is telling you you're worthless, you're a believer in Jesus, but a voice is telling you you're worthless, you're a sinner, you're no good, God doesn't love you, you shouldn't even try anymore, that's not the Holy Spirit because that's not his job. That's the voice of the enemy trying to condemn you, trying to bring condemnation upon you, trying to bring something upon you to keep you from walking in your destiny and being all that God intended for you to be. 
But the Holy Spirit, very lovingly, just like you and I, if we knew somebody was headed to a bridge that had washed out and the road signs, the warning signs weren't up yet, we wouldn't let anybody that we knew go down that bridge and fall to their death because it washed out. We'd stand there with signs and banners and flags and flares. That's what the Holy Spirit does for you and I. He's the convictor of sins of the world, and he's the one that calls us lovingly back to the Father when we begin to stray. The Bible says he's a teacher and a revealer of truth. He is the intercessor on our behalf. Uh, He's the yoke and bondage breaker, and he is the church shaker. Can somebody say amen? Amen. In the book of Acts, it says when they were gathered together and they all begin to pray in a loud voice and begin to pray in the Holy Spirit, that they, the power of the Holy Spirit came and shook the foundation of the building they were in. I think it's time we get back to praying some building shaking prayers. Amen. He's the Holy Spirit, God, the spirit, and he has a message for each and every one of us tonight. And this, this is the saddest truth of all. He is the least recognized, least worshiped, least acknowledged member of the Trinity in most churches today. But you know what? If that's where you find yourself, cause see people that all oh, God, he created everything. In fact, I was telling my science class, uh, as I teach at Wasilla Lake Christian School, I was telling my science class, you know, God's pretty popular right now because in, in the modern culture, in modern, in modern media, God can be pretty much whoever or whatever you want him to be. So it's, it's pretty okay to talk about God if you say you believe in God. But then when you start defining it a little further and say you follow Jesus, that you're a follower of Jesus, that you've been saved, you've been set free, that the blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross for you and I has cleansed you of your sins and made you a brand new creature. When you start talking like that, people have a tendency to go, oh, okay, you're narrow-minded. But even in the church circle, when you start talking further about the Holy Spirit, some people are like, okay, I got God. I get that. He created everything. He runs everything. I get Jesus, born as a baby in the manger at Christmas time, walked, did miracles, healed people, raised the dead, died on the cross, was buried, was resurrected, gone back to heaven. I get that. Holy Spirit just seems a little bit too strange for me. But can I tell you, church, tonight... You have an opportunity to encounter the Holy Spirit in a way that you've never encountered. Because of me? No, because of him. And because of your hunger for the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because of your hunger for more of God. I believe tonight if you will give God a chance, if you will give God the Holy Spirit a chance, whatever you feel like is missing in your life, he can satisfy and fill. And so tonight before we go home, if I do my job properly and you allow him to do his job, you're going to leave this place changed. Let's read a little more from Ezekiel chapter 37. We already read verse 1. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of dry bones. Verse 2. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. I mean, there's dry, and then there's very dry. And Ezekiel goes on and tells us they were very dry. And he, being the Spirit, said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Verse 4, again, he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put, you, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And then you shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 7, so I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Verse 9, also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great army. Jump down to verse 14. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's break this down just a little bit tonight. Ezekiel says, the hand of the Lord was upon me. That means that Ezekiel was taught. He was led. He was guided. He was protected. He was empowered by God. It's a wonderful thing to know that God's hand is upon your life. 
In fact, I don't know how people live with no hope that God is for them. There's a lot of people in the world that that have this feeling that God is not for them. He's against them. That God is looking for a reason to punish them. That God is some some celestial giant up there waiting to squash us like a bug. When I got to tell you, church, the Bible says just the contrary. The Bible says it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. That because he loved us so much, he offered his son and gave his son to come and die for us so that we didn't have to die, so that we didn't have to be separated from him forever. It's a wonderful thing to know that God is watching out for us, that God is protecting us, that God's hand is upon us. It says that Ezekiel says that I was brought out in the spirit. Listen, if you and I are going to see the glory of God revealed, then we're going to have to get out of the flesh realm and we're going to have to get into the spirit realm. We're going to have to quit operating in the flesh and begin to operate in the realm of the spirit. Paul asked a a group of saved, born again Christians in the New Testament, what was begun in the spirit? Why would you even begin to think to try to continue it in the flesh now? If we're going to see the glory of God revealed, if we're going to see this generation saved, if we're going to see our world turned upside down, it's going to take you and I as the believers, the followers of Jesus to move out of the flesh realm, trying to do it in our own strength, trying to come up with schemes and plans on our own. And we got to move into the spirit realm, just like Ezekiel was here. And you know what? This is the reason why we don't see more glory and more power. This is the reason why we experience so little of the demonstration and the manifestation of the power of God. It's because God does his work by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the only way to participate with him is to move into that realm. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God is not just a feeling of God touching you. Although when you feel the Holy Spirit, you know that he's touched you. You know, if I were to take an electric, an extension cord, and I were to cut one end of it off, and I were to fray the end so the wires were exposed, and then walk over and plug the other end of that, into that outlet over there, and I were to reach down and grab that wire, I would know I had a hold of something. There'd be a little evidence that I had grabbed onto something. Well, there is evidence when the Holy Spirit begins to work in your life, but that's not all he is. When Jesus told the the early church, the disciples, and the, the 120 that ended up, it started out a whole bunch more, but 120 stuck around long enough. When he told them to go tarry in Jerusalem in the upper room and receive the power of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it wasn't so they could wear a merit badge that says, now look what I got. It was so that they could then in turn turn the world upside down with the gospel message. And the same thing is true for you and I. It hasn't changed. It's not just some feeling of God touching us or even God moving inside us. But the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit is speaking of of a realm here in Ezekiel. A realm where we are led by the Spirit. And when we are led by the Spirit into that dimension of being able to hear from God and see from God more clearly and understand His heart more clearly, that's what God intends for us. I'm going to stay up on the platform because otherwise I'm going to get the front row a little wet tonight. God wants us to move into that that Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit dimension and realm. That's what he intends. John said in the book of Revelation, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. What happened when John was in the Spirit? When John got in the Spirit, in that God dimension, in that dimension of the power and the person of the Holy Spirit, he began to see the glory of God. He saw the Lord with feet like brass, as though they were burned in a furnace, and his eyes blazing like they burned with fire. He saw the throne, and he heard and saw the angels and the four and twenty elders, and he saw the altar of God. To see what John saw, church... You and I got to do the same thing John did. We got to move into that spirit realm. We got to move beyond just what we can understand with our our natural eyes and understand with our natural mind. And we got to move into getting the mind of Christ. We pray and ask the Holy Spirit. That's what the word says. The word says, pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give you the mind of Christ. Amen. Amen. Ezekiel was in the spirit. This wasn't the first time Ezekiel was in the spirit. Ezekiel chapter one, verse three, it says, and the hand of the Lord was upon me there. And it was there that he saw the great whirlwind of fire and the living creatures. And he saw the throne of God, just like John. And he saw the appearance of a man who was on fire. I know this is going to sound a little crazy tonight, but that's where you and I belong. That's the environment that we're supposed to to be in. I'm not talking about dying and going to heaven because when we get to heaven, listen, I know that there, there are all kinds of ways, different ways people can worship. 
But can I tell you, the Bible says what's going on in heaven right now has been for all eternity and will be for all eternity is worship around the throne. Angels crying out, never ceasing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now I know, yeah, the earth is full of his glory. I know there's some people that are like, why you gotta be so loud? I tell the kids at the school, look, you know, I go to a church that's loud. I go to a church that's exciting. Why you, and some people say, why you gotta be so loud? God's not deaf. And my answer is, you've probably heard it before, he's not nervous either. And it says in the book of Revelation, and I tell this to people that are like, you know, I just don't get into that raising of the hands. I just don't get into that, you know, everybody being loud and praying, you know, that's fine. God's got a time in heaven for you because it says in the book of Revelation that when one of the, the, the seals is open for judgment, that there's a space of about 30 minutes in heaven where it's silent. So everybody who's uncomfortable with lots of noise, guess what? You ought to get comfortable with it because there's going to be lots of noise in heaven, except for that 30 minute time period. Now I'm kind of messing with you a little bit there. But I want you to lighten up a little bit tonight, okay? I'm talking about living in the realm of the Spirit, in the realm of the glory of God. This is not just an Old Testament concept. The New Testament tells us that. Galatians 5, 16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I don't know why I keep going back to that thing. I don't know why I keep going back and committing that sin. I don't know why I keep giving in to that lust. I don't know why I keep hanging on to that addiction. I don't know why... Paul just said it, walk in the spirit, get out of the flesh realm of trying to do it yourself. Quit trying to find some self-help group, some, some 10 step or 27 step or 147 step and just surrender your life to Jesus and say, Holy Spirit, just like you prayed at the beginning of this, come do whatever you want to do with me. Come fill me with you. Come fill me with the power of your presence in my life. And if you and I can do that and then stay in that realm. We will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We'll quit sinning. We won't sin as much. Let me deviate real quick. I'm like Wally. He said Sunday night, that clock goes way too fast. Do you know that God's plan and purpose for you and I is to not sin? Now, I just lost some of you there. Because some, some people operate with, well, God only knows I, I'm, I'm only human. He knows I'm going to sin. Can I tell you that God, the Holy Spirit, had the Apostle John write in the book of 1 John, I write these things to you, dear children, that you may sin not. It doesn't get any plainer than that. Okay, well then, Pastor, what am I supposed to do? Because if I'm not supposed to sin and I know that I do, then I'm messed up. Yeah. Yeah. In your own strength, in the flesh realm, trying to do this in your own, trying to walk in your own strength, you and I are messed up. Now, I've never been in the military. My, my, my biological father was in the military. My stepfather was in the military. I, I got a, a brother-in-law that was in the military. I know that in the military, you go through lots of training if you've ever been in the military. Can I tell you that I doubt you've ever gone through training in the military where they said, okay, we're going to train you today how when you get into battle only to get shot just a little. They train you how to not get shot. They train you how to win. They train you how to be victorious. They train you how to take that hill, how to take the enemy out, how to be, win the battle. Now, the good thing about it is they have this thing in the military called the medic. That if you happen to get shot or wounded, you can cry, medic! And the medic comes over and he takes care of you. Because John said in 1 John, I write these things to you, my dear children, that you sin not. That should be our goal. You and I should train ourselves reading the word of God, spending time in prayer, staying in the realm of the Holy Spirit, living in that realm so that we don't sin. So that we don't wake up in the morning and go, I I just, God, today I'm just going to pray I don't sin very much, that I just sin a little. But that we wake up in the morning and go, God, say, God, you said that you've given me these things, the scripture, your holy word, so that I don't sin. So, God, that's my goal. But John also said, if we sin and if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. That's like crying medic. We have the Holy Spirit. We can cry medic and the Holy Spirit rushes in and says, okay, let me heal that area. Let me take care of you in that area. And then, and then we get up and we keep going with the goal in mind to not sin very much. I got to get back to my notes. 
Galatians 5.25 says, if we live in the spirit, then let us so also walk in the spirit. I'm not saying we should all walk around seeing angels everywhere and hearing voices and trumpets and things like that. And I'm not saying that if you're not seeing that, you're not spiritual. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I am saying is to experience the operation of the spirit. We must be full of the spirit and then we must live and walk in the realm of the spirit. In other words, the realm of the glory of God, his presence, it must become more important to us than flesh, than the things of this world. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use an example, and, and, and uh, my daughter shared something with me on the way to church. And if I embarrass you, I don't mean to, sweetheart, but it just, it just, it just resonated within me. Monday was a holiday. We were off school. So we went for a hike, and she's been wanting to go blueberry picking. She's been wanting to go blueberry picking so bad. And we just, we just schedules have not allowed. In fact, Pastor Jan can't be here tonight. She's working at the hospital, delivering babies and, and, and praying over them as they come into this world. But she says, send her greetings. So our schedule hasn't allowed it. So we go out to Hatcher's Pass and we're walking along and all of a sudden there's, there's some blueberries. Now, most people said most of them out at Hatcher's Pass, the time had passed, but we found some. And so she's picking some and she told me on the way to church tonight, she said, you know, she said, God really talked to me. She said, because I was so obsessed with getting those blueberries. I was so obsessed because she wouldn't let up. She's like, look, y'all can walk by the river. I want to pick blueberries. Y'all can walk by the, y'all can do hiking. I want to pick blueberries. She was just so obsessed with it. And she said, while she was out there kneeling down, picking up those blueberries, uh, uh, picking those blueberries, the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, why aren't you as obsessed with me as you are with these blueberries? And she said it was conviction from the Holy Spirit. And she said, so, you know, we've been, we've been trying to, to uh, step up our devotions and spending time together as a family in the word and praying together and being together, even with our crazy schedules. And she said, she said, since that time, the Holy Spirit convicted me and we've been doing that. She said, she said, I'm just happy. She said, things just don't bother me as much anymore. Church, that's what I'm talking about when I say walk in the realm of the spirit, become more obsessed with him than with our flesh, than the things of this world, or at the very least, the things that drive us, that motivate us. And, and really drive us, we ought to be just as driven about God as, as we are about those. Hallelujah. Healing, deliverance, miracles, signs, and wonders, they all emanate from that glory realm, from that realm of, of the Holy Spirit. All supernatural activity of the Spirit of God is part of the kingdom of God. Jesus reveals to us that the power over the devil or power to destroy the works of the devil or power to cast out devils was a direct result of the kingdom of God being present. He said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, but if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come among you. The kingdom of God is among us and we are to advance it. And the spirit of God is the one that provides the power for you and I to advance the kingdom. Now we may have the truth of the kingdom, And that truth is important. That truth of the kingdom, the truth of God's word, is the foundation on which you and I stand. It stabilizes us. It holds us in the right place. But can I tell you, just the knowledge of the truth is not all there is. We can know all about the truth about healing. We can know all the truth there is from the word about healing and live all our life sick. We can know all the truth about salvation and still miss out on heaven. We can know all the truths found in the word of God, but if there's not something else added to it, we're missing it. We're only getting half of what God intends for us. For the kingdom of God is both. It's the principles of the kingdom, the truth of God's word, and it's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's both. And we need both. 1 Corinthians 4.20, for the kingdom of God is not in word only, but in power. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Jude 1, 3 says, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write to you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto you the saints. Jesus, or Jude knew by the Spirit Spirit that the time would come when the body of Christ might be susceptible to slipping into a state of complacency, that it would begin to settle for a powerless faith, a faith without substance, a faith that consisted only of words and ideas and philosophies. And he said, listen, contend against that. And how did he close you by by telling us what was the key to contending? He said, pray in the spirit always. So that you may, you may build up your most holy faith. 
That's the key. Understanding the truth of God's word. In fact, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He's the one that reveals the truth to us. But he doesn't reveal it to us just so we can have a bunch of head knowledge about the truth. He reveals it to us so that we can begin to say, how do I take possession of that truth? How do I begin to activate that truth in my life? How do I begin to see the truth of God's word active in my life? And there's only one way, by the power of the Holy Spirit, working in us and through us. Everything in the, that the Bible says is ours is ours by right of inheritance. It's been promised to us. The gifts of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, those things, those truths recorded in God's Word, they are ours. And there's nothing in Scripture that would give an indication that God only wanted to do that, only wanted to give uh, the, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit to the early church. In fact, everything in Scripture that promises what God wants to do for us, it says it's promised. The book of Joel, uh, Peter quoted it on the day of Pentecost. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, and he goes on to quote, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. They'll be prophesying and dreaming of dreams and seeing of visions. And it says this is to you and to all those afar off as many as the Lord would, would call. It didn't stop. It wasn't for a select few. If you read in the book of Isaiah, I've been studying in Isaiah. If you read in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5. You've heard Pastor Daniel quote this before. It says, you know, woe to you who call evil good and good evil. Woe to you who try to make wrong right and right wrong. And it it goes on to talk about these people. And as I was reading and studying, I read in a commentary, it said, listen, if Isaiah was delivering a message to the people of Israel, and if the people of Israel had encountered the Lord like Isaiah had encountered the Lord, they wouldn't be calling uh, evil good and good evil. They wouldn't be calling wrong right. They would know who the God who I see is the holy God, his train filled the temple. You and I are created. We were created to be in God's presence, not just when we get to heaven. We were created to be in his presence, to walk in his presence, to be with him in this life. Even though you might hold the deed title, uh, the title deed, excuse me, to a piece of property, you will never benefit from it until you take your claim and take possession of that property. God has willed his power to the church. It's our inheritance and it's the power of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, signs, wonders, miracles, healing, deliverance, visions, dreams, supernatural visitations and manifestations, demonstrations and activities of the power of God in us and through us. Jesus said when he cast out devils, it was in the word and power. The Bible says that Jesus went about and did all he did. He was anointed beyond measure by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul said the kingdom is not word only. Because if it's, if we have the truth, if we have the principle of the kingdom, it must be, it must produce the power of the kingdom or it's dead. Wherever the kingdom of God is truly present, there is a manifestation of the power of God. In other words, the kingdom of God produces what it talks about. Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Wherever the kingdom of God is present, there will be righteousness. There will be peace. There will be joy in the Holy Spirit. Back down, back to Ezekiel's vision. It says, he set me down in the midst of a valley of dry bones. Jesus said Luke, in Luke 20, in 17, 21, behold, the kingdom of God is in you. John 4, 4 says, you are of God, little children, and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And and, and so we see that God has a design for the kingdom. It's supposed to be in us. It's supposed to dwell in us. It's supposed to live in us. And this vision that Ezekiel had was a vision of the great army of God. And yet when Ezekiel first encounters the great army of God, what does he encounter? A valley of very dry, sun-bleached bones with no life in them. And it says, so I prophesied as I was commanded, verse 7. I prophesied as I, was, as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And when I behold, lo, the sinews and flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Notice it says, I prophesied. That's the principle of the kingdom. The word of truth going forth. The word of God being spoken. He spoke the word of God. And when he did, good things happened. Bones came together, things got shook up, there was noise, there was sinew and flesh came upon them and skin covered them, but guess what? 
there was no breath in them. In other words, the the truth of the kingdom, the knowledge of the kingdom, the principles of the kingdom, it did some good things. It brought them together. It shook them loose from, from the old state and stuff that they were bound with. It made them look good, but there was no breath in them. If I can word it this way, in other words, they were still dead. They were pretty, but they were still dead. They were all put together, but they were still dead. They were smelling better, but they were still dead. Looking good, but still dead. I mean, you can even say it this way, and I'm picking a little, but hear me out. Had a suit and tie on, but still dead. Had their favorite pew or seat in the church, but still dead. Sang in the choir, but still dead. Paid their tithes, but still dead. Guess what? The devil is not afraid of a set of pretty bones. He doesn't care how many scriptures you and I can quote. He doesn't care how programmed we make things. He doesn't care that we got all dressed up and we smell good. None of that bothers him because without the spirit of the living God dwelling in you and I, having blown over our bones, we are still dead. If I teach on the gifts of the spirit for six weeks, but we never have a manifestation of those gifts, we're dead. If I teach on divine healing for six weeks and we get all excited about the promises, but nobody gets healed, we're still dead. If I preach and teach like I am tonight on the, about the Holy Ghost and his power and his ministry and nobody gets baptized in the spirit, nobody gets refilled, nobody gets set on fire. Guess what? We've missed the breath of God. We've missed the wind blowing upon us. When the kingdom of God is truly present, according to what the good book says, there is a manifestation of the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. And guess what? That is what the devil is afraid of. Luke 5, 17. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. That's the kingdom church right there. The teaching and preaching of the truth of God's word and then the power of the spirit bringing about miracle signs and wonders after it's been preached. Jesus was preaching. He was teaching the word, the truth, and the power of the Holy Spirit was present to heal. There was truth in the valley and the truth had done some good in this valley of dry bones, but it wasn't complete. And let me, let me point this out to you, something the Holy Spirit laid on my heart. And it's not meant as condemnation. It's just meant as something to make us go, hmm, Let me think about that for a minute. Look at the disciples. When Jesus was walking on the earth, he had 70 that we understand. He had 12, and then he had the three of the 12 that were the closest to him. What did they do for the, for the three and a half years of his ministry? They saw the miracles. They saw those raised from the dead. They saw the, the fish and the bread, the, you know, the fish sandwich multiplied, feeding all those people. They saw Jesus walk on the water. Peter walked on the water. They saw all the miracles and everything that Jesus did because when Jesus pre- preached and taught, because he was so full of the power of the Holy Spirit, that the manifestation of the power of the Spirit in the kingdom of God happened after he preached and taught. They saw all that. And they spent all that time in the presence of the living word of God. Because the Bible says that in Genesis, God spoke the word and it happened. And it says in John chapter one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among men. So that means when Jesus came, became flesh and dwelt upon the earth, he was the living, powerful word of God walking around in flesh, healing and touching and raising the dead. And the disciples saw all that. But what happened when the heat pressure got increased and the heat got turned up a little bit. I mean, they'd seen Jesus, you know, speak to the winds and the waves and cause the sea to be still. They'd see Jesus have power over nature, over all the rules and laws of science. They'd seen Jesus have ultimate power. And yet when the pressure got turned up, the heat got turned up, it got a little bit uncomfortable to follow and serve Jesus. What did they do? They scattered. But they had been in the presence of the word. Surely being in the presence of the word would have empowered them and made them, given them the ability to not flee, to not run, to not abandon Jesus, to be like Peter and, and, and deny and curse that he ever knew him. Surely being in the presence of the word for three and a half years would have brought about enough change, but it didn't. And we know the story if you've been in church or you've read the, 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 the gospels in the book of Acts. Jesus was resurrected. He appeared to them. He had, he had conversations with them. And he told them to wait in Jerusalem, to tarry in Jerusalem, the book of Acts. 
And you know what made the difference in the disciples' lives? You know what made them and gave them the boldness to stand up in the face of the same religious people who had arrested Jesus, the same Roman soldiers who had crucified him, who had beat him, who had buried him in that tomb? You know what gave them the ability to stand up and say, you know, it's more important for us to do what God says than what you say? The breath of God, the spirit of God. That ought to make us go, hmm. Because sometimes we focus, and don't get me wrong, do not get me wrong. Hear me out, hear me loud and clear. I'm going to stand up so I can make sure everybody hears what I'm saying. I am not minimizing the power of the word. The power of the word is exactly what it says. It is alive. It is more. It is powerful. It is a sharp two-edged sword. But you know what? We need the power of the word anointed by the power of the spirit to penetrate past our traditions and our false teachings and our false ideas and all the stuff out there that would seek to draw us away from the realm of the spirit and keep us in the realm of the flesh. And that's what happened to the disciples. When they got filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, we're, we're a Pentecostal church. I'm an Assemblies of God ordained minister. And we talk about in the Assemblies of God, you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll speak in tongues. Yes, you will. And yes, you should. Well, that's just a little strange for me. I understand it was strange for me. I know people, my wife being one of them, she was 13. I got time, I'll go here. She was 13 before she ever heard the gospel message. Living in America, 13. Growing up in southern Louisiana. At age 13, she was sitting outside her house. She's, some of you have heard her testimony. She, she, her, her home life was horrible. Father was an alcoholic. Mother was gone all the time. Brother on drugs since he was 11 selling drugs, all kind of mess, all kind of stuff. She was sitting on her front porch at age 13 and she saw these people going in and out of this church. And she said, God, I don't know if you're real, but there is something that is drawing those people into that church. And if that's you, I need something in my life. And the next Sunday she found herself in that church. First time somebody told her Jesus died on the cross for her, that he loved her beyond measure, that he would be her savior, that he had a plan and a purpose for her life, that he had a destiny for her, that it wasn't to be what she was living, but it was to be more. She accepted Jesus as her Lord and savior. And the first time she opened her mouth to pray out loud, the very first time she started speaking in tongues. And she said, you know, she said, I closed my mouth. I didn't know what that was. She said, I had no idea what that was. And she's been speaking in tongues ever since. I was a little slower. I was a little slower to really, to really fully grasp it. That was good for people, but you know, I didn't think it was necessary. But can I tell you what? I, I am not ashamed of the power of God. I am not ashamed of the power of God into salvation, at the, the, the cross of Christ. I am not ashamed of anything that the Bible says is available to me. The Bible says that when I pray in the Spirit, that it's the Spirit of God praying through me on my behalf, praying the perfect will of God. You can't get any better than that, church. If God knows the perfect will that he has for my life, and I don't know it fully, but he does, and I don't know what to pray, so I begin to allow the Holy Spirit to pray in me and through me, and I begin to speak in that heavenly language that Jude talked about that I should do daily to build up my faith. And I know that according to Scripture, when I'm doing that, I am praying the perfect will of God for my life. Guess what? That prayer is going to get answered. Because if anybody's going to answer the prayers, it's going to be God answering his prayer for my life that the Holy Spirit prays through me. So I don't, I don't shy away from the tongues thing. Okay. There is the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It happened in the day of Pentecost. It happened in all the accounts in the book of Acts. When they prayed, they laid hands on them after they got saved and said, receive the Holy Spirit. We baptize you in the the Holy Spirit. And they begin to speak in other tongues. It was the evidence, kind of like grabbing that extension cord. You knew they had a hold of something. So I'm not, I don't back up from that. But that's not the only reason that Jesus said, tarry in the upper room and receive the promise, receive the gift. That was the sign that you received the promise, that he was now filling you to overflowing out of you. Jesus, it says in the gospel of John that Jesus said that there will be rivers of living water that will come flowing from their belly. And the the commentary, John says that he was speaking of was the Holy Spirit, which had not been given yet. 
So Jesus said that's going to happen. But the reason that they needed the power of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Spirit of God, the third member of the Trinity living in their lives, filling them to overflowing, was so that they could do the works of Christ. And what does the Bible say? It says Jesus was manifest to destroy the works of the enemy. And Jesus said, greater things than I do, you will do. But you and I will not destroy the works of the enemy. You and I will not fulfill the manifest, manifest of the kingdom. We will not advance the kingdom doing it in our own flesh flesh operating in our own our own flesh we got to move out of that and move into the realm of the spirit and allow him to do whatever he wants any way he wants any time he wants I'm sure I've probably said this before when I was preaching I want to have a relationship with God that is so close that I that I mean the 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 heroes of the faith listed in, in Hebrews and all throughout scripture they were just like you and I they were just like you and I in fact, Wally said it Sunday night, the book of James says that Elijah was a man just like we were. We are. He was human just like we are. But yet when he lived in that realm of the spirit, he was able to pray and the heavens shut up for three years. It didn't rain. And then when he prayed again, it started raining. That's the realm you and I are supposed to walk in and live in. That's the power that we should be demonstrating. And here's the reason why. Because the world is sick and tired of religion. Well, aren't you religious? Lord, I hope not. Jesus, forgive me if I am. I I know James says pure religion before God is this, that you care for the widows and orphans and keep yourself pure, undefiled from the world. I understand that, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that religious spirit that drives people away, that religious spirit that keeps people at an arm length. And the example in the New Testament was the Pharisees. Jesus said they they have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. That not only do, do they make it, uh, not only do they have all these lists of things, but they make it even harder for people to come to God. The Pharisees and religious leaders of Jesus, they took the Ten Commandments and expanded them to over 400 things that you needed to do to be right with God. Jesus did the exact opposite. He took the Ten Commandments and summed them up in two. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you do this, you're fulfilling the commandments. Jesus came to make it easier to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus came to make it easier for you and I to live in the realm of the Spirit. And the, the way he did it was says, be baptized in the Holy Spirit, receive the Spirit, let the Spirit of God dwell in you and overflow out of you, walk in that power, stay in that power, operate in that power, function in that power, communicate in that power, prophesy in that power, lay hands on people in that power, in the Walmart drive, in the Walmart aisle, you better believe it. Walking down the street, Look, I mean, again, I'm, I'm so off my notes, it's okay. And I'm going to close here in just a minute. But again, look what happened after the day of Pentecost. Peter and John are on their way to the temple to pray. They'd pass by this same guy who'd been there. He, because it says he was laid at the temple. The crippled guy was laid at the gate of the temple every day. And he was begging for alms. And the same people that had denied Jesus had said, I don't know him, uh, and cursed and denied him three times and scattered and went back to doing what they were doing. Now they were full of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, the power of God, the realm of the Spirit is what they were walking in. Peter stood up and preached. 3,000 people got saved on the day of Pentecost. They began to cast out demons, raise the dead, heal the sick. They're walking to the temple, and the guy's begging for alms, and Peter looks on him and says to him, look at us. And he looks at them and, and he said, Peter said, silver and gold have I none. And whoops. And as he was doing that, he reached down and grabbed him by the hand. But such as I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And he pulled him up. Now you better know that you're full of the power of God. You better know the God that you serve. You better know the realm that you're living in if you're going to do that. But that doesn't mean we shy away. Well, I'm not sure. No, we got to live by faith. The same God that promised it to the disciples, those that waited in the upper room, the same God that revealed himself to Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and all the prophets, the same God that spoke through James and John and Peter and 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 Paul is the same God that wants to operate in our lives through the realm of the Spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's available to you and I. It's a gift. Now, if, and I say if, if I had a $100 bill in my back pocket, And if I said, I got a hundred dollar bill here and it's a gift for somebody in this place, it would stay a gift until somebody got up and said, I'll take that gift and came forward to take possession of it. It's the same thing in, in, in moving into the realm of the spirit. It's a gift. It's a promise. We have to receive it. 
We need the power of God. The Spirit of God was telling Ezekiel, you're not finished yet. You've prophesied and the bones are now bone upon bone and they're skin and flesh, but they're still dead. There's another thing. The job is only half done. Alex, Pastor Alex, would you come back to the keyboard, please? He was saying, Ezekiel, if these bones don't experience the power, you've only given them half the message. Then he said unto me, prophesy unto the wind, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. And that's where we're at. We need to be praying the same prayer. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Spirit of the living God. Come, mighty power of God. Come in power. Come in demonstration. Come in manifestation. Breathe upon my life. Heal me. Heal my body so that I can in turn impart that to other people. Heal the sick. Deliver the bound and the oppressed. Set the captives free. Break every yoke. Destroy every bondage, every habit, every addiction. Cause the lame to walk and the blind to see. Open deaf ears. Work miracles and wonders and signs among us. Fill the hungry. Send the fire. Baptize us with power. Verse 10 says, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, a great and exceeding army. I prophesied tonight to you, that's what's coming to the body of Christ. There's a mighty wind of God that is coming to the church. And many that have been satisfied just to know and have a knowledge of the truth, they're not going to be satisfied anymore. And they're going to cry out for the power of God to come upon their life. The breath of God, the wind to move among them. The anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. God is getting ready to hit churches. And God is getting ready to give us another book of Acts revival before he winds things down. Because guess what? We're never going to reach the world with a powerless gospel. I hope you heard me. We will never reach our high schools. We will never reach our workplace. We'll never reach the marketplace. We'll never reach the corporation that we live, that we work in. We'll never reach the community that we live in with a powerless gospel. But I got to tell you, when people know that you've grabbed hold of something, there's some evidence in your life that you've tapped into something. And that's a power that's beyond you. And that when you lay hands on them and you pray for them and you minister to them, that things begin to change in their life, you won't be able to stop them from seeking you out because this world is desperate for a manifestation of the truth of the power of God so I say church why not us why not us I say to you right now individually all across this place some of you I know very well some of you I'm just getting to know some of you maybe you weren't invited by me but you're here for the first time why not you why not you Why not allow the Spirit of God to do something in your life? I don't blame people for not wanting to go to a dead church. I wouldn't want to go to a dead church either. Oh, you're being judgmental. I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm just trying to make it plain. Church ought to make a difference. It it shouldn't be something that's just a, yeah, you check it off your list. Did that. I I fulfilled my religious duty on Sunday morning. Now I can go four-wheeling or fishing or hunting or camping or watch the game. And there's nothing wrong with hunting, fishing, camping, four-wheeling, watching the game. I do it all. And not a thing wrong with it. But if going to church is just some, some religious function that you do, listen, people are religious about how they tie their shoes. They are religious about how they brush their teeth. They have a religious routine in the morning. They do the same thing. And if that routine gets messed up, it just messes up their whole day. Guess what? That's being religious. God wants us to move beyond being religious. He wants us to move into the realm of the Spirit. He wants us to to be that kind that when the Holy Spirit says, hey, go here, lay hands on the third person that you see, tell them that I love them beyond measure and that I'm the answer to all their needs and watch what I do. I want to move when he says that. I want to do that when he says that. And I'm wondering, is that what you want? Because remember, I had you pray at the beginning of this service setting you up and I knew exactly what I was doing the Holy Spirit will only operate in your life the Spirit of God will only empower you to the extent that you ask him and invite him he is the God he is God he certainly has the power to move in and make you do whatever he wants you to do but we know that God doesn't love us that way he loves us and says choose 
But here's what I'm giving you. I'm giving you a gift. I'm giving you power that'll make you victorious over sin. I'm giving you power that'll cause you to be able to kick that addiction once and for all. I'm giving you power that'll be able to help you to get over that pornography addiction and, and not only just turn it off, but get if you need to, get rid of I've said it before. If your smartphone is causing you to sin, get a dumb one. I mean, come on. Oh, I need my iPhone. Well, if, if in the middle of the night when nobody's looking, you got your iPhone and you're looking at stuff you're not supposed to. Pastor, what are you talking about? The Bible says in Psalms, I will set no vile thing before my eyes. I'm preaching now. Why not us, church? Stand with me all across this place. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you're not satisfied with where you are in your walk with Christ, I want you to respond in just a moment. Maybe for some of you, you're like, I don't even know if I have a walk with Christ. I don't even know if, if, if I'm saved, if I'm going to heaven. I don't even know some of the things. Hey, pastor, don't make any sense to me. That's okay. I quoted enough scripture to tell you it's truth. If you're not satisfied with where you are, you know that your life is not right before the Lord. You know that if you were to die tonight, you wouldn't make it to heaven. You need to respond in just a moment. Or maybe you've been walking and serving the Lord for a long time, but what you started in the Spirit because the Spirit of God convicted you and He filled you and you moved and operated in the realm of the Spirit, you now trying to continue in the flesh and you're tired of that. You know, it doesn't satisfy anymore and you want more. You want to move back into that Spirit realm. You need to respond in just a moment. If you need to see a manifestation of the power of God in your life because you need a miracle, you need a healing, you need a deliverance, you need to be set free once and for all. You're sick and tired of being sick and tired. You know, some people ought to just get sick and tired of being saved just enough. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Saved just enough to know they shouldn't be sinning, but still struggling with so much sin that they're miserable. Man, just quit that. Just sell out. Just give it all to Jesus. Allow the Holy Spirit to fill you and, 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 and cause you to live in a realm and a dimension that you've never dreamed of. But He has. He dreamed it for you. He created you to dwell there. You don't need to wait to get to heaven to, to, to then be in God's presence all the time. This is a warm-up for when we get there. That's why we ought to worship Him in spirit and in truth with everything that we have. And worship is not just singing. It's not just lifting our hands. Worship is an attitude of gratitude that without Him we can do nothing. Without what He offered us, we are dead in our sins and trespasses and we are on our way to hell. But He has offered us a way to get saved and made right and be born again and become a brand new creature and be empowered by the Holy Spirit to change this world. I tell those teenagers that in the high school, especially in junior high, but I even tell my elementary PE, and again, I tell you, please pray for me. I am not a children's pastor, but I teach elementary PE. I'm talking K4 and K5. You can only do so much with K4 and K5 in a gym before they get restless and get wander and whatever. So it's like herding cats, okay? But I tell all of them, Every time I get a chance to speak to them, you're world changers. Because I'm prophesying their destiny. That if they believe in Jesus, they will change this world. Because you know what? That's what I speak over my own children. The Bible says that the, the children of the righteous will be mighty upon the earth. So some of you need to quit saying that sorry son of mine, that sorry daughter of mine. And you need to begin to change what you prophesy. And you need to begin to declare the truth of what they are, who God says they are, what their destiny is. They are world changers and they are destined to change this world with the power of God in their life. So I'm looking at a room full of world changers. If you're willing to allow the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to in your life. So here's what I'm going to do. I've asked the ministers in the house, the pastor, other pastors in the house, those of you that are part of the, the prophecy team that know how to pray, 
You've been released by the church to pray for people. I've asked you and I'm asking you, you help me out. But I'm, there, I'm making a declaration to everybody within the sound of my voice. If you're not satisfied with where you are in your walk with the Lord, you need to begin a walk with the Lord. You need healing. You need a manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Get out from where you are and come line up across the front. Fill these altars. We want to pray for you. We want to minister to you as Pastor Alex sings. Holy Spirit. As you come, just begin to worship. Lift your hands. Maybe you've never done that before. Well, guess what? Nobody in here is going to make fun of you or tell you you shouldn't do it. Just lift your hands right now. And just begin to worship Him. Just begin to call out. I'm going to come through and lay hands on people. But I got ministers and pastors and leaders here. They're going to do the same. Because it would take me a long time to get to everybody. There's still some people here. There's still some people here. You need to be down here. And before we begin to fully minister, we're going to do something. But I want to give people a time to come. Keep singing. Yes, Lord. Everybody that's responded, and even those of you that haven't, we're going to get the first step out of the way. Listen, in order for you to be empowered by the Spirit of God and walk in the Spirit and move into the realm of the Spirit, you got to be right with God first. You got to have Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You got to confess any sins and be forgiven. So I want you to repeat this prayer after me, everybody in here, so we can get everybody taken care of. Even if you didn't respond, there's still time. You can still get out from where you are. In fact, oh, I'm bold enough. I'm like the guest speaker because, see, I'm not the main, I'm not the pastor here. So I'm like the guest speaker. If you're standing next to somebody, before I lead us, all of us in this prayer, turn to them and say, would you really like to go down there? I'll go down there with you. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're full of the Spirit. You're walking and living in the Spirit. But maybe that person next to you isn't. And maybe all they need is just a little nudge, just a little encouragement. So come on, activate the evangelist in you. Ask them. And if they say, yeah, I'll go if you'll go, then come on. Step out from where you are. Come on down. All right, even as others are still coming, everybody in the house, repeat this prayer after me. Let's get this settled once and for all. Repeat this prayer. Father God, thank you that you made a way for me to be saved, for me to be made right in your eyes. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me, for my sins. And by, and by dying on the cross, you paid the price for my forgiveness. So Lord, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Make me new tonight. And I give my life to you. In your name. Amen.